many things that worked not that long ago in Lebanese history. Unfortunately, it's before our time, but it's our parents' generation, our grandparents, and maybe even before them as well. Transportation was a lot more sensible. Um, it's, it's just bizarre still to see these sort of rail, railway tracks next to the highway at times. And you just sort of look at them. This is from the late 19th century, right? We didn't, I mean, that's, that's early, early on in, in modern Lebanese history. And we did that. I have stories of my parents and perhaps even grandparents drinking from the tap that the water was clean. Uh, and we used to, pr we used to produce more electricity than we needed. Up until, I think, the Civil War, if I'm not mistaken, there was a surplus of power generation. And then you have the post-Civil War order, which, in my mind, just resembles the Civil War with a lot of patchwork, a lot of cosmetics, and it's not sort of a, it's not a proper restructuring of what should be a functioning state. Today, in 2020, you have all this sort of, uh, all these great policy plans, and I actually had fun watching you... Uh, survive an interview on TV on TRT and you were uh, I think you were in Bangkok if I'm not mistaken yes. <laughs> yeah so you were I mean, way away from the problem but there were two I mean all discussing the Lebanese power sector and you have you have what seem to be decent ideas being expressed and you can read these policy plans there they're, they're, there's not I mean the intention is always good and there are decent people that do try at times but then you have also this sort of lethargic power sharing machine that seems to curtail all decent ideas in Lebanon today. And if I'm just going to ask you a specific question here, where does the problem lie? If you were to address the core issue of why it's so difficult to generate power in Lebanon and sustain it and to reform an important sector like the electricity sector, what is the core issue? Is, is it simply just a matter of pure corruption? That we're not able to tackle corruption or is it is it mismanagement that we have incompetent people running the ministry i mean i guess because somebody who's who's an expert if you will on this issue what what is the core issue that needs to be fixed okay so what you mentioned about the services that used to work in the past in lebanon is actually very important uh it's my point of view the point of view that after the war, the system was that was built or actually remained in transition for the for 30 years now was just put in place to be a deterrent for any act, violent act, any kind of clashes between between the different mm -hmm. sectarian um, communities in Lebanon. So it was it was kind of making sure that nobody is going to actually clash with each other or go into a war. At least that's how it remained in the transition period for 30 years. Right. So we didn't evolve into an actual state. We remained in that limbo for, for three decades. Right. And that has resulted in a way in ensuring that everyone has a say, but everyone has a share of the pie. So nobody has any incentive to actually change whether any sector or, or the actual build a state. Um, so, and that's, we see it, I think, the most obvious in the power sector because it's tangible service. We're not just talking about something uh, that's abstract. So you can actually right. find it in the power sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were, you were going to well, ask. No, no, but I, yeah, because it's something that we, I mean, it's, it's crazy that we got so used to this problem. But yeah, it impacts everybody in Lebanon. Sorry, so I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry, go ahead. No, but it's exactly... That's my point of view. So yeah. by ensuring that everyone gets a share of the pie of everything in Lebanon, you're actually ensuring that there is no actual opposition or actual competition. So I normally refer to mm. it as competition because anything for anything to thrive, you need, a, you need a competition. As an individual, if you don't have a competition, you're not going to try to improve anything. And that applies for, for the economy, for the power sector, but also for the state level. So yeah. everyone is just sitting there not having any incentive to actually change anything because everyone is just happy with things being as well. But when you say competition, I, and I, I hope I got this right, and I've read some of your pieces and, and watched you and, and listened to your interviews, that it doesn't necessarily mean privatization, that you're not sort of encouraging the private sector, at least the way we know it in Lebanon, to take over, that that would resemble the state's mismanagement too. I, I hope I got that right. Yeah, so 
I personally do not believe that privatization would work in a state like Lebanon because mm-hmm. you need to have a specific context for, th- for privatization to actually work, starting with transparency, good governance, being able to actually put a value on the asset, mm-hmm. and a, a, a lot of factors that are not there in Lebanon. So no, and this is why I advocate for competition, not privatization. So privatization is just at the full privatization level, is just um, changing the ownership from the state to an actual company. It's one company, so there's no competition in the market. Right, right. This is why once once you have more companies and you have private sector engagements, like through PPPs, but also PPPs like public-private partnership should be put in a specific framework and regulation and ensuring the right procurement, solid procurement process. Otherwise, it might just fall back into a monopoly. So can I ask you, though, what does competition then look like the way we know it in Lebanon, at least in this sector? What would that translate to? So we might actually unbundle the power sector. So the power sector oh, has okay. three kind of subsectors, which is generation, distribution, and transmission. So mm-hmm. the state can keep the trans- transmission through the power headlines, uh, and uh, you can actually unbundle. So there would be like three, four, maybe five companies doing the doing the generation, other doing the distribution, so it has to do that. And okay. you can actually do the public-private partnership, with, which was actually the 2019 policy paper had the focus on PPP. But uh, there's a PPP law in Lebanon. It was passed in 2017, it's law 48, that's bypassed for the electricity sector. Although in its Article 7, I think, it, it, it just emphasized that this applies for the power sector. Right, right. And you need a solid procurement framework because you might actually tender a lot of, a lot of projects and they can actually fall back to the, same, to the same owner, to the same company. Right. So this is why you put um, regulations against monopoly and you do an actual transparent kind of procurement. You know, uh, so you've, you've pointed at a few things that I, I've been sort of thinking to myself mostly (laughs) in New York during coronavirus, sort of just trying to figure out this topic before speaking to you. And you've you've hinted at, and you've said this in in several ways, that the end of the civil war is a, in a way, the the biggest victim is the Lebanese state. That post-civil war, the Lebanese state is 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 the first, in a way, to erode. And that's sort of a, uh, it's almost like a, warlike militia intrusion into the state and then taking bits and pieces of it and using it for for ill gain 30 years ago in the last 30 years are there are there particulars in that where you see potentially big obstacles that are too difficult to overcome at least when it comes to things like the protest movement or or for that matter an imf bailout or even unlocking the said money are are there in, are there big big problems that cannot be fixed unless the whole state is is in a way repaired and i guess what i'm asking is does it go beyond power sharing simply or are there corrupt factors within that that have sort of taken over certain sectors and if that, and you say as much as you'd like about this i'm not trying to even name names here in particular but just the the idea of tackling this the what's left of the state and holding people to account to me it sounds great it's something i would want to but i i find it very very difficult to see certain things happening yeah um, yeah so yeah it's easier always it's always easier said and, and i'll just give an example that the generator industry that's one sort of very clear sort of uh, obstacle and yeah, yeah. So the generators is just one of the many vested interests mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the sector. And the longer you normally have a crisis, and that just doesn't only apply to Lebanon, it applies to, uh, to everywhere, the longer the crisis actually is happening, the more vested interests you're going to have. Yeah. Um, you have the fuel economy, you have the generators, you have the procurement, you have uh, an entire uh, vested interest everywhere. Yes. And that's power sector and then everything in the state of Lebanon. So it's it's very hard to actually change that. But we've seen in so many places in the world, if you do have a champion, and they, they might actually make it happen. So the face I have for Lebanon, and I know it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, 
Uh, and I want to stress that reforms, whether in the power sector or in Lebanon in general, throughout the entire economy, is probably not going to be straightforward or linear. It might actually fall back in some places. Mm. It might take several, several years. But we have we keep we have to keep pushing forward and in and engage all the stakeholders. So it's citizens, uh, uh, civil society organizations. You have the experts, academics. You have the government. But everyone, it, we need to come to that stage where there is public consultation, where everyone is actually involved. So the hope I have for Lebanon is that one generational change. I think I think that's mm. the top of it. Mm. Uh, if I look into it, into the entire Middle East, so the Middle East has the largest youth population, yeah. and most of that is actually unemployed. It's mm-hmm. more than 30% on average, and that's double the global average. So unemployment for the young population is normally a destabilizing factor, yes. which means that this young, and the way I see it in the Middle East, these young people now with internet, now they can travel, now they see how easy it is actually to, to have to have services, it's not something that's very hard to implement. You just need accountability and good governance. And I find that more and more they're stressing for 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 these factors and for accountability. Um, the the of course there's a risk in that, and the more you have unemployment and the govern and the government cannot tailor that for that, it might actually lead to more extremism, or more immigration. But when immigration it was harder. It was hard post uh, prior to COVID nineteen and post COVID nineteen. Sure. It got even worse. Yeah. And with employment rising everywhere in the world, so I f- I think that it might be just the opportunity that these young people in Lebanon are going to to have to actually I have to say I, I cannot actually keep running away from Lebanon. I'm gonna have to actually fix it in a way. Yeah.